Frank, you want to kick it over to her slide? There we go. All right. I don't know. Can you see if you watch our live streams, they'll delay, but Frank has the current slide that's showing in the top corner of the Zoom there, just mm -hmm. so you know which one we're, we're showing to the live stream. So cool. So typically what I do, if it's okay with the club, um, basically I, you enable screen sharing and I will present the screen so you guys can see it on big picture as well. Um, also hi, Facebook, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're on Facebook and YouTube. Oh, no pressure. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> cool. That sounds awesome. Um, yeah, so I will show it on the big screen and we'll go over the slides um, and the presentation. Um, pretty lax. It's, uh, it's uh, if you have any questions or anything, I won't be able to see your faces, um, but you know, there's the chat box. Anyone feel free to, you know, message in there. Um, and then, like I said, it is casual. We can open up the floor for Q and A, but if anyone has a question during, I don't know if you guys are all muted by, the host or not, or just by choice, you're just all like really good representatives of the club where you're just like, yeah, we're going to be quiet right now. I haven't had to throw the band hammer mute down yet, but uh, oh, it's, good. the so nuclear option is always an option. So we just got like a really studious group. I'm into it. Everyone uh, is uh, muted on purpose because um, I'm broadcasting the full screen presentation of who's ever speaking. So if you cool. don't wish to see your face on YouTube or Facebook, um, I asked everybody to mute themselves and some people don't want to necessarily be seen. So as long as they stay muted and they ask their questions through the chat, we can regurgitate their uh, their questions in uh, in face for those of us that are comfortable oh, being perfect. on, the, on the internet. Yeah, and that also helps me that everyone's muted because I have a really short attention span. So if I see something, I'll be like, what? And then I'll forget where I'm at. So it's probably for the best uh, that everyone is is as quiet as possible during the presentation. Again, like I said, it's super casual. We're drinking beers, we're gonna have fun. Um, and feel free to ask me all the questions. And if there's anything that I get stumped on, uh, then I'll, I'll always follow up with you guys. Uh, I'll just uh, email Lee. Um, so otherwise, uh, if you are all ready to get going, we can get this show on the road. Yeah, it looks like, all right, cool. <laughs> looks like the slides beat me to it. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I'm just gonna, so is screen sharing enabled? It is. It looks like it is. Okay, cool. I'm just going to open up my big screen here. Give me a second. I'm really not tech savvy. As you'd think as many times as I've done this, I would just know, but every time I'm like, why does this take five minutes for me? Okay. So can everyone see that? Not currently. Okay. See, I told you it always takes, this is good. Hi, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I say, well, you're working on that. Did you tell us what beer you're working on? You said you picked something up that had a uh, Imperial yeast. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a homebrew. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> I'm drinking a lager. Uh, oh no, well, lager pills. I'm drinking a Pilsner right now. Um, that was made with uh, L26 Pilgrimage. Um, not to rub that in your guys' face because it's not in homebrew just yet, um, but I keep trying to push it in that direction because it's a really, it's the on deck strain. Um, and is everyone familiar with Imperial Yeast before I get it? You, everyone brews it. You could just nod your head or um, thumbs up works too. Um, cool. Cool, cool. All right. So then, and and as far as like um, uh, experience, we're all like, all we got some beginners, some some novice, some real brew, like some professional brewers, or everyone's kind of all over the the map. We've got a pretty big mix in our club, and including people are here today. I see at least two professional brewers, and Rad. then some home brewers and even a uh, home brew retail operator. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, sweet. So you might have two. All right. See the <laughs> cool. So if you ever, I don't know if you carry Imperial, but you should. Um, and if you, uh, if you ever call, you may be able to get me on the phone sometime. Okay. So you guys are all looking at my Google screen right now. We see your Google screen right now. Sweet. Thanks for your patience, guys. And bearing with me on uh, on this one. 
I don't know why, uh, <laughs> give me a second. I'll just bring it up on here. Oh, cool. Thanks. That's a relief. I'm like, oh, cool. This is going to be, everyone's going to see me uh, stumbling to pull it up on like live. That's yeah, awesome. no, it's fine. Um, yeah. If you, if you want to present, you can, um, I said the, the slides person. Um, if people are interested in seeing the slides person, they can right click it and pin it and go to presenter view and that'll be large for them. Perfect. And your screen share is ready. I'll take it off of currently it's just showing the uh, first slide of your deck, which looks like some agro plates and a couple of speakers. We should be good now. Good. I can see your Imperial Yeast starter slide, so yep. Oh, sweet. Oh, yay. It only took me 10 minutes, you guys. That's, it's fine. I was early. It's cool. We're hanging. Okay, cool. Um, so just a little introduction about myself. Um, so my name is Liz. I'm happy to be here and chat with you all about uh, kind of behind the scenes of what Imperial does. Um, I've been with Imperial now for a year, so I'm like, I was new for like two days. <laughs> the company's been expanding and growing, and um, and we, uh, Imperial was founded, just a little backstory, Imperial was founded in 2014 uh, in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we just officially opened up our East Coast location, which is super exciting, and that's in uh, Philly. So uh, we were basically founded on the principles that if you're going to do something um, to do it right with providing best service, best yeast and full transparency of what we do. Um, so that being said, uh, before COVID times, we would like, we usually had folks come visit us at our Portland location and we'd walk folks through the, through the lab to check out our process. Um, so today I'll show you basically some behind the scenes of, of what our facility is all about. So your imagination is gonna be required for this one. Um, and then hopefully when the world resumes back up, uh, maybe someday you can visit us in the future and then you could see me like do this again, but you know, you're not through a screen. Um, so our first slide here. Um, so if you're walking with me through our facility, this would be the first stop. Um, so, this is our lab on site. We have a negative 80 Celsius freezer for our mother cultures. And we have about 200 uh, collected strains in our bank. And those come from all different sources, whether it be other labs, um, people, brewers sending in, you know, different uh, strains or things to play with. Even home brewers have sent us stuff to play with, um, but we're not propping those uh, those strains all the time. Um, but we do have 27 plus our seasonal core strains for the homebrew and commercial side, which I'm sure you're all familiar with if you've used Imperial. Um, we're propping those regularly. So in case the apocalypse happened, as if this isn't it, um, we also have a backup freezer as well. Um, so, you know, when the world is ending, you can still brew beer. So that's pretty good. And, you know, we need to drink beer while it's, you know, <laughs> get too dark. Um, so when it basically, when it's time to build a prop, um, just so we're not opening and closing our freezer all the time, uh, we have a bank of auger slants, which are working slants in a nearby fridge. And this is where propagation will start from. So from that working slant, uh, we will grab a small sterile loop um, of cells. We'll inoculate it in a test tube. And, and about 50 mils of growth media with, um, with that, we'll put it on an incubated shaker table for about 24 hours. And after that, we'll transfer it to a flask, add more, more growth media, and then back to the shaker table. And then we'll have it go to its next destination, which is production. Any questions so far? It's pretty straightforward. Um, so, this looks like, I'm sure everyone's been inside of a commercial brewery before, nothing new. So this looks a lot like a commercial brewery. 
Um, we have tanks, we have hoses, we have a brew kettle. Uh, uh, we have our stainless steel conical fermenters. Um, and every tank is also glycol outfitted to obtain specific temperatures. So we originally started on a five barrel system, which you'll see in the next couple of pictures. Um, and now we have a 30 barrel, barrel system. And basically what's happening there is we are brewing the same boring beer over and over and over again. Uh, a few key differences from a commercial brewery, uh, there's no grain because that would be a source of potential infection. Um, instead, we are using organic DME, uh, sugar, and yeast nutrient. And let me know if I'm going too fast. I tend to like not realize sometimes that I'm just like talking. Um, so here's a little bit more production. So uh, just a deeper look of our brew house here. And since we've expanded uh, from the last time this picture was taken, there is now quite a few more tanks. I believe six more 30 barrel fermenters since this picture was taken. So where that person is standing, it's pretty tight. Um, and we also relocated to a new building because we were just growing out our space, which is a good problem to have. Um, but so you see right here uh, on your left, we have this, uh, this brew kettle. Uh, our brew kettle works just like a pressure cooker to produce a very sterile wort. Um, all the ingredients in there are brought up to 240 degrees Fahrenheit and are under roughly 10 pounds of pressure. Um, and basically a typical day in production is uh, from what you got at the, at the lab. Production goes around to feed each tank when we're ready to grow from that initial inoculation. So day one, uh, the flask from the lab and first edition of media will go in. Um, day two, a little more media. And then day three, a lot more media. So all the tanks uh, like to ferment somewhere in the 70s, with the exception of a couple of Belgians, which tend to like it uh, a little bit warmer. Um, and you can also see just over here, there's some blue hoses you can see above the tanks. And uh, those provide sterile um, air, as we know, oxygen is extremely imperative for the yeast cell wall growth and replication. Um, and as each strain hits terminal gravity uh, and the pH, we then cut the individual air regulators and cold crash to harvest. more production. So as I mentioned, once the tank is crashed, we are ready for harvest. Depending on the strain, it can be anywhere between one to three days to pull all the yeast out. Some uh, strains are easier to handle than others. Uh, some strains are tend to be a little bit feistier due to flocculation characteristics, just as they would be in your homebrew pouch when pitching. Um, but there is some sad news with all that being said. Uh, once we have harvested the media, aka the really gross beer, uh, that doesn't taste good, I can assure you, uh, we dump it and no, we're not distilling it. Um, people ask us like almost every homebrew chat, like, so you guys should distill it. I'm like, I think we have enough work on our hands <laughs> making yeast, so we're not going to become distillers in the process. And it's really gross. You don't want to drink it. Uh, so it's no one's that sad when it gets dumped. Um, but then, uh, here we'll go, uh, once we've done that, we'll send our slurry back to the lab for blending and counting. And then here is Kendra. She's working on quality control on a computer. Uh, she's not in a lab co individually counting a bunch of cells because that would be super labor intensive. Um, it's not as glamorous. She's not wearing her white lab coat and, you know, mad scientisty, um, as we imagine it. Kendra is actually using uh, the Nexlum salometer to count cells, as you see there. So this software takes out a lot of the labor of using a microscope, and it will determine slurry density, percentages, and viability. So when we're ready to count a sample of the yeast, we run a serial dilution. And the last step of the dilution, we will load a, a sample of the diluted slurry with a series of photos on the pre-made slide grid into the machine here. Um, and then we'll introduce a dye that fluoresces 
which will show alive cells on the left, and it will also infiltrate dead cells uh, to the total of live cells on the right. So we want to ensure uh, 1 1.29 billion cells per gram of slurry. And here you can see there's a grid image that counts the living cells for us. And it's very important that we're hitting uh, spec density and viability before any yeast goes out the door as we ensure consist consistency across the board with every strain. So each lot of yeast will then go through our PCR machine, which will test a lot of yeast by taking a snapshot of DNA to search for specific STA1 gene known as Dystaticus. Um, more quality control. So then we're using these plates here and this will also perform another part of QC uh, to make sure that there are no common beer spoilers or contamination. So we use differential media plates to make sure we have pure cultures. Um, different growth on those plates will determine if something looks off and if there is something we want to be there or not. For example, like we don't want Brett in our Saccharomyces strain. We don't want any type of contamination. Checking for Dystaticus. Um, the plates will also go through aerobic and anaerobic uh, testing as well. And this is pretty standard practice uh, at multiple points during propagation. So once the lab has cleared the slurry, it's good to go into package, which is its final destination. And that's to you guys or the commercial side. Quick question. Sure. What do the colors mean? So uh, different plates will have different colors and they'll also change colors depending on what, they've, what they're trying to track on there. Um, so I like specifically, that's like definitely like a lab folks kind of question, but they determine what's on what plate by the color that's on there and they can change colors if something is off. I told my, I was talking to my boss about this today and I was, sometimes we go over like some of these, these slides and stuff. And I was like, some stuff is just lab folk stuff. I'm like, I can, it's differential media, <laughs> long story short, but good question. Any other questions thus far? And am I talking too fast? I think it's the idea that I'm on Facebook. I'm like sweating. <laughs> I say, don't worry. It's one of our uh, streams happened to break. So you're in a smaller audience. Oh, oh man. Uh, man, that's, that's a huge bummer. Uh, <laughs> so I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, I mean, not cool, not cool at all. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, some of the story ends up in pouches. Uh, each pouch gets 155 mils, AKA 200 billion cells per pouch. So when pitched into five gallons of wort, it gives you a pitch rate of 10.5 million cells per mil. And this pitch rate is associated with quick, healthy fermentations. Uh, your pitch rate is really key to making a uh, great beer and reduce any off flavors due to stressed out or under pitched yeast. So since we've gone through all the trouble of creating healthy yeast, here are some ways that you can preserve the health of your yeast from your end. Um, so the patches you receive are good for four months from the manufacturing date. Uh, our tech team actually worked on a long-term viability study. It was over the course of six months in a controlled environment um, with all of our strains across the board between the temperatures of 34 and 36 degrees. And what they discovered was um, at, the, at the four month mark, at least 90% viability uh, was, was still happening. Um, that's just, so that's basically, I try to ex explain this to people because a lot of people are using viability cal calculators and they're, they're not always the most accurate, um, solely because there's a lot of variables with how that yeast was handled, where it was stored, you know, transit times, if that pouch is in, you know, bloated or whatever the case may be. So I don't always trust the viability, uh, of those calculators, um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, in, in the future, whenever you're using them. We did this study, but there are strains that do, um, they will drop off quicker. So we noticed uh, in the study that, you know, ales were, were pretty good, 90%, uh, everything was pretty good around 90%. And then after the four months, lagers dropped significantly quicker in viability. 
Belgian beers, Belgian trains could be a little bit more hardier. So it's got a lot of things to consider when you're actually thinking about viability. Um, uh, that being said, um, when we say pitch cold, I mean literally um, pitch uh, directly from the fridge. Um, and I know like a lot of you are, have used other yeasts where you kind of, it's your brew day, you wake up, you bring that pitch out, that pouch out, you kind of let it get to room temp. And then you're like, all right, cool. Now I can pitch it. Um, quite the contrary for Imperial. Um, basically when the yeast is kept cold, it's in a metabolic hibernation. So when it begins to warm up, uh, this can cause off gassing. So if you've ever seen your pouch get a little bit puffy, that's what that is. Um, and basically uh, the yeast is beginning to eat its reserved sugars. And we don't want the yeast to activate in the pouch because it needs a happy nutrient rich environment for best results. Um, and then a lot of people will bring up thermal shock. Usually when I tell people to pitch cold um, and I pretty much, I've noted thermal shock as being like a mythological creature at this point. Um, it's really hard to get thermal shock. Um, as long as you're following the uh, guidelines on your pouch, as far as temperatures, you should have no issue. Also just for, you know, full, you know, um, disclosure, all of our commercial breweries, a lot of them are using yeast brinks where the yeast is kept cold anyway and direct pitching that. And we haven't had any issues. So I, I wouldn't ever worry about thermal shock. As far as I'm concerned, it's like almost not real. It's gotta be really like vastly different. Okay, the best time to do a starter. Starter in the event that the beer is over 1070 or 70 or 17 Play-Doh and or li larger than five gallons. You could also do a starter uh, when brewing lagers as well. Um, another recommended time to do a starter would be if the yeast, yeast pouch is swollen, as I mentioned earlier, um, if it's older than four months, or if for whatever reason you accidentally froze that pouch, then I would recommend uh, thawing it and then doing a starter. Uh, the ideal default starter would be two liters. And we base this number off of the number of cells since we need enough fermented sugars to cover 200 billion cells in order to have a complete growth cycle. So there's a lot of feeding that needs to be done and we need an adequate amount of nutrients. And then here's just like a side-by-side -side, uh, stir plate versus no stir plate and what to uh, expect out of that as far as timeline. Does anybody here harvest? A couple. I meetings. have before, but it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah. We have, uh, amongst we our have ranks, members. we have a former uh, medical doctor who has a full set of slants and craziness oh in his freezer. Um, as he retired from the profession, he is he here? Uh, he's not in this meeting. He was last month. Um, he's our formerly our beer meister. Um, but oh yeah, my God. having uh, a background in biology. Um, he, for a lot of members, uh, maybe some people in this meeting, he became a yeast bank for a lot of them. And for a lot of years would propagate yeast from various commercial strains and keep store of them. Well, good. I'm glad you didn't tell me like beforehand. And if he was here, cause that was too much pressure. <laughs> 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 I know, I know quite a bit of things, but I don't know everything. Guy's making his own strains. <laughs> I don't need that kind of pressure in my life. <laughs> um, no, but harvesting is great. Uh, our boss would love to say something like, just get a new pouch every time. Um, but it is a good way to get to know individual strains. That being said, um, getting to, you know, getting to know the strains individually. But um, be sure when you're harvesting, practices are very sanitary and refrigerated uh, as soon as possible once it hits terminal gravity. And this is as simple as using a mason jar. Uh, to store it, and when you repitch, repitch by weight. So 200 to 300 grams of slurry per five gallons of wort. Um, and then as far as storage times, uh, don't sit on harvested yeast very long. Uh, a couple of days is okay. Weeks, you're starting to get a little iffy. And then if you're going past weeks, just at that point, I recommend just getting another pouch. Now, every now and then I get someone who tells me that, you know, they had success with something that's been sitting around for a long period of time and like good on you if you have i would love to hear your process um i just i just these are good guidelines i would follow um 
Moving along. So this was the picture that my boss thought it was really important for me to let you know that this is a throwback Thursday and it just happens to be Thursday. Um, this is what, this is baby Imperial that you're looking at. Um, they're looking at a bird or a plane, um, given the pointing. Um, but who you see here is Walker, who's the one pointing at the sky or something really exciting up there. Beside him is Jason, one of our owners. And then over there in the green shirt is Andrew, who is now running uh, our East Coast operation. And this is what Imperial started on. These, these little baby fermenters that I wish I had a garage to have them in and like never leave it. Um, but yeah, it's a little flashback here. And we're gonna go over some simple tests to make your beer better. And we can breeze through these. Um, and I can also send, uh, I can send Leah some, some of the tests over to share with uh, the club as a resource as well. So VDK, this test will uh, factor the presence of diacetyl in your beer. Diacetyl is that buttery slickness in beer that we don't want to taste in your final product. Um, here it says to do a side-by-side -side to um, sample, but you know, for so you have a controlled and a variable um, if we're being, you know, very, scientific chemistry class here um but you can totally get away with just doing one sample but like you can do two i do one <laughs> i do one and cheat because you know why not um so you can do side by side or get away with doing one um and basically uh you can microwave it or put it in a water bath um but uh, you want to heat that sample up and then you let it cool down and then you perform a sensory and if you're still picking up any off flavor, uh, give it a couple of days to clean up and it should be good. But you can also perform a uh, diacetyl rest if you do have temperature control. And diacetyl rest is basically uh, when you're upping the temperature just a couple of degrees um, and that will just kind of move that, that cleaning up just a bit quicker. Um, but otherwise, um, I would just give it a couple of days because I don't have all the equipment that we all want. Uh, forced ferment, performing a forced fermentation test is great. Uh, it's a great thing to do for maybe your first recipe or a higher gravity beer, or maybe just not sure if the yeast is doing the job, whether it be under attenuation, uh, a wort fermentation, or any yeast issues you may be experiencing. Um, and for this, it's also pretty simple. Uh, you just grab a sample of your beer and add extra yeast, wet or dry, it really doesn't matter and you're basically performing a mini fermentation. So measure the sample gravity and know there's many factors in the outcome. Uh, it can be under pitched yeast, it could be wort fermentability, it could have to do with the mash temp, the grain mill or any other adjuncts. Um, and those can all affect your results, but this is just a nice aid for troubleshooting and getting a ballpark of your yeast activity solely. And then word stability, this is just a reminder that if you're really confident in your cleaning practices, this should be a no-brainer, um, but just something you can keep in mind when homebrewing in the future. Questions? All right. Yeah, we had, sharing. sorry, um, I had a bunch of stuff to uh, get through. We had a question from uh travis on facebook so do you suggest doing starters if you could cold crash and decant prior to pitching so um the only time i can you reiterate the question do you suggest doing starters and if you should you cold crash and decant prior to pitching i guess i didn't read that correctly the first time so um... do you do starters and when you do starters should you decant off the Sort of what you guys call the disgusting beer from your prop process and decant off your own prop of media when pitching as a uh into a batch yeah yeah you can definitely decant off that uh, that excess liquid and then pitch it into your batch Does that answer the question hope so he's normally in this call but it doesn't, doesn't look like he is today travis where are you <laughs> um <laughs> Um, also, um, that being said, for anybody who's not in this uh, Zoom meet, you could always shoot me an email as well, Liz at Imperial Yeast, and I'm, or you can call me, and I'll give you my business line. 
I'm not going to say it over, over this because there's definitely, but <laughs> I'll send an email to, to Lee and uh, you can have my number and we can, we can definitely talk about, we love, I love talking to people. So I, as you can see, that's why they have me do this. <laughs> Any other questions? What about making starters on a stir plate? Yes, we do this. What um, about making starters on a stir plate? Is that a question or is that a statement? I didn't see that one. I think it's from Bergmeister. Oh, Chuck. Chuck. Did you, did you private message it? Go ahead and unmute and answer, ask the question, Chuck. Oh, Hi yeah. there, oh, Liz. Oh, you guys, I didn't realize. I'm like, no one's talking. <laughs> oh, no, 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 because we're all being polite because most of us are adults and I'm probably the least or the most childish or whatever. Oh, um, that's okay. I'm right that you're in good company. But you guys yeah, yeah. can totally, if it's okay with the, the club, you guys can totally unmute yourselves and chat okay. if that's so, okay with Facebook peeps. There are there are many podcasts that I have participated in or at least listened to. I'm a big fan of the Brewing Network, and I've been listening to them, especially the Jamil side. And Jamil deals mm -hmm. with Chris White a lot. Yeah, and yeah. I own the East Book and all that stuff. Oh, and yeah. I, do, I mean, you know, I don't do anything without a starter, even if it comes dry in a package. So we make all of our stuff. And I've talked about this in a lot of our seminars as well. So uh -huh. I understand that your yucky beer in the formal terminology is supernate and correct. Uh huh. Okay. So you are recommending, obviously, that you get rid of all the yucky oxygenated supernatant that's there on the stir plate, depending on how long you've been, you know, stirring it and multiplying it or propagating it, I guess is what I want to say. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about that. And that's where a lot of this string of um, questions that I've sent to you. And oh, you, okay. you've actually been answering them as I've been sitting there typing them on in. It's like, okay, thank you. Oh, good. Uh, okay, thank you. And all that kind good. of stuff. So, so wait, just, sorry, uh, go on. No, no, you go on, please. Okay. <laughs> no, um, I, I guess what I'm narrowing it down to. So are you doing starters even when you're getting like a, a fresh pouch? Oh, sure. Oh sure yeah, yeah, been, absolutely, sure absolutely. While, you know, too. working on you know a, a, a ten Plato forty gravity uh, um, lower uh, level of sugar, so you get your yeast propagation instead of stressing the yeast. So all sure. of a sudden, I'm super pitching some things, uh -huh, and uh -huh. then many times I'm using that as a propagation for some future beer, mm -hmm. and. Uh, even though I've got my hemocytometer, which is another one of my questions right here. You guys are talking about your cellometer, which apparently is your computer program. Yeah, the next one. So there's a probe. That. So there's a probe in there that's somehow understanding uh, like photo ionization or something yeah, like that against the background. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so with that, then and uh, us lamos that have, you know, only, you know, a thousand power microscope. Uh, that use a you know a hemocytometer and that and counting and that. I'm looking at what you're saying that uh, with your then um, correct me because I might be overthinking on this one. You said you guys are going through 1.92 billion cells per 1.29 billion our spec yeah. density. Yeah. Yeah. So that's per milliliter then. Yeah. Okay. 1.29 per mil. Is our right. spec, spec I've got to get into my book a little bit more. I actually have the 400 power um, microscope that I've got. You know, it's a phase contrast, so it's like looking at blood and all that stuff. So I've got to get in a little bit farther into my counting and understanding. But you know, sure. I am now using the old hemocytometer and that. Oh, okay, that's really so, cool. Also, like not limo equipment. Um, I don't have anything like that at home. <laughs> so the fact that you're, <laughs> so the fact that you're cell counting at home is pretty freaking cool. So well, I'll I, leave it at that. We've but been also, doing it for a long time, so I'm just trying to understand. So, no, yeah, I'm not, it sounds I'm, like it. Also, to reiterate. Um, just to go back to your starters uh, question. So for our uh, pouches, 
yes. if you have a fresh uh, pouch or you know anywhere in that four month uh, shelf life and, and there's no issues with that pouch, you actually don't need a starter. I know it's contrary to a lot of things that you've learned when you were brewing prior to, you know, imperial yeast. There's a lot of definitely, that was like always a thing, like always make a starter before you brew, always have a starter just to, you know, have enough of those cells. Um, but with imperial, because each pouch we have, we provide 200 billion cells, you don't need a starter at all for five gallons of wort. So oh. just something, you can totally do it. It's, you know, it's hard to over pitch. Um, a much easier under pitch. It won't like hurt your beer if you, you know, want to do a starter to for peace of mind. Um, but uh, if you want to like, I don't know, cut out some of the labor, you can totally just pitch that bad boy and you'd be good to go. Yeah, I know, but it's kind of fun. I, hey, if, you, if that's what I'm saying, if you're into it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, Liz. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, if a lot of people on this uh, club Brew a little bit bigger than a five gallon batch. Just a little bit. So, sure. would you recommend? How big you guys? What are you brewing over there? Pardon me? <laughs> what size are you brewing over there? Oh, 10 to I 15 gallon gallon? barley wines. <laughs> but I know um, people yeah. that brew some pretty big batches. Yeah, so, no. So, what do you got? Actually, myself and Tara were the retailers that they were talking about. So, we actually sell your product. So, so buy two pouches of Imperial from the Homebrew Pro Shop. Nice. Um, so, so if you're doing a 10 or a 15 a gallon batch, would you say go with two or three yeah. pouches? Or would you say buy one and make a starter and propagate it up to what you, you can prop it up? You can go honestly, you can go either either route. And it also has to do with your uh, your starting your specific gravity. Um, so our right. pouches are good for anything uh, and what you're brewing, of course. So one pouch is good for up to 1070 or 17 Play-Doh. Um, but if you're doing a bigger beer, uh, and we also have a calculator on our website as well uh, for home brewers and for commercial that you can always dial it in if you want to be like, if you want to dial in like specific pitch rates to what we, we recommend. Um, and that will tell you like, you know, do, I talked to someone today who was brewing a batch uh, that was 1085. Um, and it said to do, and it was a five gallon batch and it said to do one and a half pouches if you really want to dial it specifically, but if you're doing anything up there, I would recommend, um, definitely if, especially a 10 gallon batch, do two pouches or prop it up. Either way would work though. And you're, Especially if you, you have enough yeast to, you know, get the job done and you're not having, you know, a sluggish, uh, ferment and you want things to turn over pretty quickly. Oh yeah, I haven't seen Imperial be very sluggish at all. Yeah, me neither, but I'm biased. <laughs> um, so your your calculator is based off of the 90% through four months? Yeah, so uh, so we don't have a viability calculator, um, but rest assured, because viability is also one of those things that's really hard to, that's really hard to dial in because it's such a variable thing. But if yeah. it's in that, you know, I mean, you're a real retailer, so you're getting, you're kind of in a position where you get the freshest pouches anyway so like because we package to order so i mean the viability you shouldn't even have to worry about unless you like run out of yeast um, right. when you look at other uh, yeast calculators uh they start reducing the viability of the yeast from day one all the way down to yeah the and six you know, and, or whatever yeah and so and that's like so that's hard because there's so many things, there's so many things on the internet and like, it's almost like everyone, you, know, you go on a blog and everyone has an opinion of what works and what doesn't. And some of it can be really informative, but some of it can be a little bit misleading. If the owner was here right now, he'd be like, he would say in the kindest way, like, fuck those calculators. <laughs> but if they're just not, it's really hard for you to determine like, oh, it's, you know, day six. Oh, I must have dropped, you know, a percentage. Like it's, I I think yeah. you're, I can guarantee that um, if you're treating the yeast, you know, and I'm sure you are, um, if you're treating it, you know, right when it's delivered and you're putting it right in, you know, it's in that nice sweet spot of temperature, you are good at, you're, you're not hogging the conversation. <laughs> you are, sorry, I didn't realize you're private. Um, <laughs> 
you are good at uh in that four month time frame i wouldn't even worry about viability unless there's something off with the pouch like it being swollen or accidentally frozen you yeah, I, no, I, I am personally not worried about viability because i oh, know for, right starters and so forth and i've actually even uh, used some of my outdated yeast when you guys were only a three-month product versus a four-month shelf life and it was to see oh yeah yeah, I, I've got pictures of the mess it made in my fermenter <laughs> fridge to prove it. Because yeah, I everybody that everybody oh. that buys the yeast, I tell them that you have to set up a blow off tube instead of using an airlock. Otherwise, you're going to be doing some um, cleaning. Yeah, I know. Our yeast is really when it's happy, it's happy. Um, I used to tell people in these homebrew zooms that. Uh, our pouches, I used to tell people like, yeah, you, some of you guys are familiar with the three month, month pouches, but I started going away with that because I've been doing this uh, Zoom meets and have, meeting some people who are either new to Imperial or, you know, first time using Imperial. And you're actually the first person in one of these Zoom meets that are like, hey, I remember those three month ones. And I was like, so I should start bringing that back. But I was like, I don't even know if you guys know that it used to be three months. But yeah, four months. It's pretty good. Yeah, Imperial is still what I would call a relatively new yeast in the retail market as far sure. as, you know, a lot of the club members and uh, AHA members and people like that know about it. But some of the uh, little more novice people that don't brew as often don't know about it quite so much yet. But Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's people like you who are, are representing and we're, we're stoked to, to be able to have those relationships. So I have yeah, a... Like yeah. It's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I recently started, this is totally a tangent, but that's how my brain works. I recently started uh, actually calling homebrew shops and uh, rec I've been recruiting this whole thing of like homebrew talks. I, Lee, I think I just like, I randomly hit one of somebody up and was like, Hey, Hey, what's up? <laughs> and it's it, in the beginning, it was like, I didn't get, I didn't expect such a, a great response, but I was like, oh, holy shit. We got like a lot of Zoom meets coming up. And now, now I'm, I sort of, the calendar is full, but it, there's a good healthy pace because it was like, whoa, you're doing four of these a week. <laughs> and luckily now we have other people on them. So I was originally, since I was the newest of the company, I'll give you guys a little insider. Since I was the newest of the company, one of the newer people, uh, there was another, Nina was the one who uh she was doing a lot of these and i'd just listen in and like comment and be like hey and then do like the second half like the starters and stuff because i know that's stuff better from home brewing um so now i'm just trying i'm still getting my feet wet but y'all have been great and uh especially being live or wherever i am out there <laughs> we can uh, there was we can send you a link to the uh the final oh no i don't want to watch up. it um, so <laughs> we had a follow up from Travis on Facebook. So regarding, um, you know, creating a starter and it's kind of been a theme so far, creating a starter and pit and decanting off. And are you still concerned about pitching cold? Um, sort of, I think the idea is letting your yeast warm up. The yeast starts consuming like sort of crud that's in the package with it. But if with a starter, yeah. it's already sort of ready to go into you're, that environment. So pitching warm is... Um, and I've gotten that question before uh, because, you know, uh i don't know a lot of maybe more people are like a little literal thinker i'm very literal so when i hear pitch cold i'm thinking what about that starter um but you're fine you have adequate number of uh cells in there at this point now that you've done the starter you can just direct pitch it and you don't have to like put it in the fridge and and then pitch you can just you know once you're that starter is ready you can just pop it in there and you'll be fine uh and Cause then at we that have... point you've already, you've already grown it up yeah. Um, we also had a very important question from someone in the in the call. Um, you need to bring Pog back. Um, they're really excited to have that back on the shelf if that's possible. Noted. Well, people, uh, I'm writing that down. People really like Pog. It's great. I love the Kvike strains. They're so fun. Um, people always ask, like, where do our trends come from? Like, oh, well, you know, how do you know what's the next thing? And I'm like, we don't. We follow you guys. Whatever you guys are brewing is what how we know. Like if you're like if everyone's pumped about something, like for instance the A44 Kviking. I'm sure if you're familiar with Pog, then you're familiar with the A44 Kviking. But 
yeah, thumbs up. I know you are. <laughs> um, but uh, that was something that we did a seasonal once or maybe a couple of times before my time. And it had such popular demand that we wind up getting rid of B-51 and B-63 to uh, get uh, A-44 Kviking in our lineup. And it's as easy as that. If people are asking and requesting, you know, especially when, you know, what people are brewing, we want to try and supply that. And it's different for yeast. We can just grow that up and be ready to go within a couple of days, opposed to, you know, having hop contracts or malt. You can just, we can really, a lot of that stuff is already in house. And if it's not, it's, it's pretty easy to source. Like, you know, it's no secret. Uh, yeast labs get yeast from other yeast labs too. Any other questions? Frank D. Frank D. Any other questions, anyone? Yeah, I've got one, uh, one question for you. What's your favorite strain that you have there? What family are we talking about? Are you talking uh, about lagers? About... Are you talking about ales? Yeah, let's let's do one of each, uh, lager and an ale strain. I like these questions. Someone asked me my what would be my ideal brew house if I was ever a professional brewer. <laughs> um, okay, favorites. Uh, I think AO7. Uh, it's the flagship. It's the genetic equivalent to Chico. Um, you can do so much with it, and it's versatile. Um, so you can, you know, brew a bunch of different styles. So I definitely would gravitate towards that yeast for any, any beers, uh, in that, in the ale category, um, for lagers, uh, I would go with L17 harvest. That's the Augustiner or origin. Um, and that you can get a lot of, you can do, uh, you know, you can do a Pilsner with it. You can do like Hellas. And I love German beers. Like anybody who likes craft beer, we love our light crushable German, German lagers. Um, so L17 is definitely my jam. Um, and uh, GO3, if we're going in Germans, because uh, that's the Dieter. And actually, you know what? So... I've been fortunate enough to go to Cologne and I've been to, um, I've been to Dusseldorf. So it's a tough one because I love Kolsch's and I love uh, alt beers. And actually the last beer I brewed was with GO2 Kaiser, which was insane. Um, I guess I'll say, I'll say GO3 Kolsch because it's a little bit uh, more user-friendly, I guess, if you will. Like I can drink a lot more Kolsch than I drink alt beer, but I do love alt beers for that. It's really hard. Just don't ask me about the German beer, <laughs> German selection. Uh, GO3 probably. Um, and then Belgians, B56 Rustic, farmhouse uh, strain, really nice for saisons. Uh, you can get a lot out of it depending on what temperature you ferment it at too. If you're going on the cooler side or the warmer side, you can push those esters. Uh, I would have to go with B56 Rustic, yeah. Also, blends are fun too. Has anyone ever done like? Some people are like, "That's like sack, like you can't do that." But I'm into blend cultures. Not everyone is. It's very experimental. Um, so I don't know if anyone here has ever blended two different strains. But it's if you're ever really trying to experiment and have fun, it's it is fun if you're into it. But I know not ever. Some people are like, "Oh no, I would never blend anything." I'm like, "All right, well, I would." That's on my to-do list to try, but I haven't done it yet. Yeah, and there would be so many cool ones. Like, I think sometimes I think about like, you know, future future brews, and I'm like, should I do this or do that? I was uh, when I um, this uh, actually this lager that I'm drinking right now, uh, this pills I'm drinking right now. I thought about originally blending L28 and L17 just to see what would happen. And L28 is the the Urkel. And uh, I didn't. My boss, one of my bosses, talked me out of it. He was like, "Why are you gonna blend it?" I, was like, I don't know. Because it'd be fun. He was like, "Nah, just go with L." He was like, "Just stick with one." <laughs> and L seventeen is, is a good one. Anybody else out there have any more questions to hit Liz with? Or speaking of fun, how long does it take to come up with like the sub names? Oh God! You guys have long meetings and just. <laughs> 
Dude, and some of the Viking like, Sour Patch. Bats. Oh God, yeah. No, we have a like a Slack channel, and some of the names. I mean, myself included. I always go for a pun because I'm just like a dad. <laughs> like I just imagine I'm just a dad all the time. So I'm like puns are where it's at. But I think you know not everyone's into puns, but it's it's a lot of like really bad names. It's a like. You know, it's it's uh, a diamond in the rough. You know, you got to find that one needle in the haystack and you're like, all right, that's the name. But it goes through a lot of people, a series of people <laughs> dropping really no. bad names. And then it's like, screw it, we'll just go with this. So you're using a yeast now that's not out? I know, I wasn't supposed to say that. I feel like oh. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's not that it's not out. You haven't uh, thought of the catchy name. So <laughs> Facebook, look away. <laughs> it's um it is a string that we carry i'm i'm pushing for it to get on the the homebrew side let's say i think the issues is the packaging size of it right now yeah it is it's so if well if you guys are ever you know when the world goes back to normal if you're ever doing a, a big brew you always get a commercial pitch just saying um but yeah it's it's cl26 pilgrimage which is an is the l26 i'm gonna request it there you go. Oh, so tell right people, like, request it. Although I said that so many, I said that a couple. No, I won't say so many times. I don't know who's going to see this. Um, I uh, I said it a couple times in meetings, and and my my Nina, who was in the meeting with me, she was like, "Dude, don't tell them strains that we don't have in pouches." And I was like, oh, yeah, "I'm sorry. I just love that strain." Um, the L17 is just as good. It's all up to opinion and what you like to get out of it. They're both great strains, though. But if I can, on a Friday, on a slow day, snag something from the lab, it's one of the perks of the job. <laughs> it comes with the territory. Any other questions? Let's say you guys have like a gluten-free line. Yeah. We so do you have like gluten testing in, on in-house? So we, uh, some stuff we get, we would, uh, you know, we would take out to get tested. As far as gluten-free goes though, um, we actually have a separate uh, tank that is only intended for gluten-free. So it never gets cross-contaminated at all. Um, and we have, so some of our strains, we can prop up anything and turn it gluten-free if we, you know, it's just, you need special ingredients. So sometimes getting that media will take a little bit longer than, you know, getting a standard, uh, non-gluten free uh strain um but so there there is a little bit of a timeline sometimes it's like three weeks or so three to four weeks depending on getting those materials um because we are all organic so some of that stuff does take a little bit longer to get than you know just you know overnight um but all of that would be separately done and it it would be you know it would go through everything to make sure to ensure that there's no gluten in it as well and we can prop up any of our strains and make them gluten free. That's, I don't know if anyone was familiar with the W04 that we have right now. That's the Paramount. That's a gluten free strain. It's a seltzer strain. If anyone's, you know, trying to hit up those trends um, and make some Trulies or whatever, we'll have you some claws. Um, or uh, right before that, we had the gluten free bubbles, which was a cider strain. So, uh, and then on our commercial side, we can make anything uh, gluten-free if someone requests it. And we do. Some people are like, you know, if they want, you know, 838 juice uh, fill and they want it gluten-free, we will we'll grow it up for them. Cool. Right. Well, if nobody else has any questions, we can uh, wrap, I, wrap up. I have a question, Ryan. Oh, sure. Um, so I, I um, have a brewery and we, uh, we brew three barrel um, batches at a time. And I have recently started kind of experimenting with under pitching um, Omega's Hornigal strain, their Kibbe mm -hmm. strain. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I have pitched as few uh, homebrew packages as like six mm -hmm. in a three barrel batch. And it goes absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. um no off flavors and um I've, I've used this strain in ipas barley wines all kinds yeah. of different stuff um i know you guys don't have it in the the homebrew side but mm -hmm. um from a 
a non-homebrew side of things do you sure. guys you compare the the, the Bartleby um, to that in terms of under pitching so as far as the Kvike strains go and this is uh, anecdotal I'll say because you know um, this is something that I hear from brewers a lot and there is success with it um, you can get away with under pitching the Kvike strains um, as you're doing it now and having success with it it's not unheard of um, we would recommend if you were going to under pitch uh, under pitch by 50%. Don't go too low. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, Kvike's one of those strains, like you can kind of, it's kind of crazy. It's like an anomaly. You can stress it out. You get a good beer. You can ferment at 90 degrees. You get a good beer. Like all the things where you're like, this is a no, no. You'll have a solid beer after Kvike, which is like <laughs> crazy. And it's super universal. As you're saying, you've brewed a bunch of different styles with it, um, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to, for instance, go with the A46 Bartleby, which is the genetic equivalent of the Hornadol that you're using, literally comes from, uh, the great thing about, you know, yeast is no one could patent a, you know, it's a live culture, so no one can actually own it. Um, so when we have, and I'll actually share this with the club and you, if you want to see it as well, um, Courtney, um, but it's, we have a cross-reference sheet. And it basically tells you all the origins and um, uh, across the board, like the different genetic equivalents that Omega carries, Y yeast, White Lab. Um, but yeah, you can definitely, is, is that your question? Just like, can you do that with the A46 Bartleby as well? Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, you can totally... I've only ever used Omega's strain mm -hmm. to, to underpitch. Um, I've gotten yeast from other vendors um, yeah. with the same strain. It's kind of weird to be like, I need three barrel pitches of X, Y, Z, but I want a one barrel pitch of this. And I, I find that there's a little bit of resistance to suggesting an under pitch, even in that strain. So I was just kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. We genuinely, like, we genuinely don't say, hey, go under pitch that. Um, anecdotally, I do hear a lot about it. I mean, our standard pitch rate is a liter per barrel up to 70, 17 Plato, and that will give you 11 million cells per mil. Um, and that will, uh, that's associated with modern brewing science. Um, and that will give you shorter uh, lead times, quicker, healthier fermentations, multiple gens. So, you know, the, what you're pitching is going to give you the best results to your overall finished product. But a Kvike is one of those things where, um, you can get away with it. I'm not going to say you can't. Um, you can totally get away with pitching that under 50%. So the fact that you're having success doesn't really shock me. I've talked to a lot of people. Some of the things I hear about bike, I'm like, you did what? And it worked? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. I will definitely share uh, the, the resources as well with the club so you guys can see the origins and stuff like that and get to know the strains, um, whether you're brewing something new for the first time or you're trying to experiment. Um, but yeah, anecdotally, but I won't say go ahead and go for it. I will say not unheard of and, uh, you can totally get away with it. And I've said the same thing to, you know, other brewers who are doing it and having success with it. Uh, go for it. If it's working and you're happy with it, this is your brewery. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a yeast seller. Um, if things are successful, I never want to deter people away from that. Um, especially even with our pitch rates. Um, we also like, we have standard recommendations, but we do dial in specific pitch rates to what people feel like, Hey, this has been working in our brew house. I want what's going to work best for your brew house. You know what I mean? You know, your brewery best. I'm just an outsider consultant who's providing you with a product that will make the beer, you know, happy and delicious because without it, you know, you're just hanging on to sugar water. <laughs> do you, have you heard, um, in, in talking to other brewers that um that under pitch um reusing the yeast um a second or third or fourth time do you have you heard anything about the quality of the second reharvesting and repitching yeah. if you under if you under pitch that initial one um i haven't heard i mean i have yes and no i can't think of like a specific conversation um, but I do know that, you know, there are, you know, definitely people, I don't want to sit there and quote and say, yes, I have. And then you're like, cool, I'm going to, you know, crank this out. I'm on my 10th gen. And like, so I don't want to go ahead and say, yes, I've heard that. I, you know, I'm sure that it's not, I'm sure it's been done. Um, do you, how many gens are you getting out of your Hornadol? I've really only done it, uh, four times. Um, I, okay. I really and like, are you having, good, four. 
Are you having good success with your gems then? Yeah, I mean, typically I, I keep it the same uh, style of beer, but I, sure. I have um, taken the third time, so into the fourth pitch and put it into like a, a really high ABV barley wine just to kind of mm -hmm. see if I could build it up from each um, sure. iteration. Um, and it definitely had a little bit more fruit character than I would typically like really like in a barley yeah. wine, but um it worked pretty well. I just, I, I was afraid to, to continue, continue to continue the, yeah. yeah keep, and that's like a trial going. experiment. <laughs> like, Oh yeah, this is a, but I mean, if you're getting four gems, that's for a half under pitching, that's, that's pretty good. If you're happy with what's, ha what's coming out, you know, minus your fruity barley wine, which isn't the worst thing ever. <laughs> yeah. It, it definitely is kind of an interesting, like, financially like a, a sure a saving measure but I I also didn't know if I had just gotten like lucky and yeah. won't happen again kind of yeah a yeah I I mean like I said I won't say like I don't I don't have that conversation a bunch about multiple gens from under pitched kvike um but if it's working and it's successful um then you know do what you do what you're doing and you know I guess fourth gens one day maybe you'll you'll push it to five and still have the same results. I don't know, but that's you know, that's yeah. pretty cool. I like to I like that you're getting the most out of your yeast. I'm always telling people like, yo, crank that baby out and get as many gens as you can. Like, I want you to be utilizing it as much as possible. Like, it just makes sense and it's more bang for your buck. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank All you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Good questions. All right, we got to get switching over to our beer tasting here. Liz, you're welcome to hang around. Oh, if you wanna... I'm getting in the boot. <laughs> no, we, we just have to get, we had our members turn in six samples of Bell's Too Hearted. We all did clone brews. Oh, I love Bell's. Bell's is great. Um, um, so if you, you're you welcome to, I know you don't have it. You're welcome to kind of hear our tasting notes as we do it. If you're curious, I, think, but... I, think I'll, uh, I think I'll sneak out of this one okay. and you guys so... enjoy it. Um, Thanks but, for your time, though. Yeah, it's been a pleasure hanging with you guys. And um, if anyone has any questions or anything, uh, feel free to shoot me an email uh, or give us a call. Liz at Imperial Yeast, and you can always give us a call. Um, and uh, I'll send over those re resources. And uh, don't be strangers. Um, and, you know, happy brewing and enjoy. And thanks for having me and enjoy your, uh, your tasting. Yeah, thanks for coming. We'll make sure to circulate your uh, contact info again when we send out our meeting notes in case anybody missed it, you know, or didn't. Yeah, and I'll send it click. over to Lee as well. So so Lee can send it to the group. All thanks right. again so much, you guys. Have a great night and have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Stay safe.